Uh, well, welcome back to machine learning. Uh, one of the most exciting things this week um, Almost certainly the most exciting thing this week is that fast AI is now on pip so you can pip install fast AI um, And so thank you to Prince and for to Karem for making that happen uh, to USF students who had never published a pip package before and this is one of the harder ones to publish because it's got a lot of dependencies um, so it's you know probably still easiest just to do the conda env update thing But um, a couple of places that it would be handy instead to pip install fast AI would be well obviously if you're working um, Outside of the the repo and the notebooks then this gives you access to fast AI everywhere um, Also, I believe they submitted a pull request to Kaggle to try and get it added to the Kaggle kernels So hopefully you'll be able to use it on Kaggle kernels soon Um, and uh, yeah, you can use it uh, at your work or whatever else um, So that's that's exciting. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to say it's like officially released yet You know, it's still very early obviously and we're still You're helping add documentation and all that kind of stuff, but um, it's great that that's now there A um, Couple of cool kernels uh, from USF students this week um, I thought I'd highlight two that were both from the um, text normalization um, competition, which was about um, trying to take text which was um, uh, written out, you know, written, you know, the standard English text. They also had one for Russian, and you're trying to kind of identify uh, things that could be like a first, second, third, and say like that's a cardinal number, or this is a phone number, or whatever. And I, I did a quick little bit of searching and I saw that um, there had been some attempts in academia to use Deep learning for this, but they hadn't managed to make much progress and um, I actually noticed uh, so Alvira's uh, Kernel here which gets point nine nine two on the leaderboard, which I think is like top 20 um, Is uh, yeah, it's kind of entirely heuristic and it's a great example of, of uh, Kind of feature engineering and it's in this case the whole thing is basically entirely feature engineering so It's basically looking through and using lots of regular expressions to figure out for each token What is it, you know, uh, and I think she's done a great job here of kind of laying it all out clearly as to what all the different pieces are and how they all fit together and um, She mentioned that she's maybe hoping to turn this into a library, which I think would be great, right? You know, you could use this to Grab a piece of text and pull out. What are all the pieces in it? Um, it's the kind of thing that The neural the natural language can like natural language processing community hopes to be able to do Without like lots of handwritten code like this, but for now this is well, It'll be interesting to see like what the winners turn out to have done, but I haven't seen Machine learning being used really to do, to, to, to do this particularly well um, Perhaps the best approach is the ones which combine this kind of feature engineering along with some machine learning um, I think this is a great example of, of effective feature engineering and uh, this is a um, another USF student who did has done much the same thing got a similar kind of score um, but uh, used uh, used her own different set of rules um, Again, this is uh, gets you would get you a good leaderboard position with these as well So I thought that was interesting to see um, examples of uh, some of our students entering a competition and getting kind of top 20 ish results By you know, basically just handwritten heuristics and this is where For example computer vision was uh, Six years ago still basically all the best approaches was a whole lot of like carefully handwritten heuristics uh, often combined with some simple machine learning um, and so I think over time you know the field is kind of uh, definitely trying to move towards automating much more of this And actually interestingly uh, very interestingly in the safe driver prediction competition which just finished um, uh, one of the Netflix prize winners won this competition and he invented a new algorithm for dealing with structured data which um, basically doesn't require any feature engineering at all uh, so he came first place using nothing but uh, uh, five Deep learning models and one gradient boosting machine um, and his uh, his basic approach was very similar to 
what we've been learning in this class so far and what we'll be learning uh, also tomorrow um, uh, uh, Which is using fully connected neural networks and we're and uh, one hot encoding um, And specifically um, embedding which we'll learn about but he had a very clever technique Which was there was a lot of data in this competition, which was unlabeled. So in other words um, where they didn't know whether that driver would go into claim or not, um, or, or whatever, so unlabeled data. So when you've got some labeled and some unlabeled data, we call that semi-supervised learning. And in real life, most learning is semi-supervised learning. Like in real life, normally you have some things that are labeled and some things that are unlabeled. So this is kind of the most practically useful kind of learning. And then structured data is, is the most common kind of data that companies deal with day to day. So the fact that this competition was a semi-supervised structured data competition made it incredibly practically useful. And so what his technique for winning this was, was to um, uh, do data augmentation, which those of you doing the deep learning course have learned about, which is basically the idea like if you had uh, pictures, you would like flip them horizontally or rotate them a bit. Data augmentation means creating new data examples, which are kind of slightly different versions of ones you already have. And the way he did it was uh, for each row in the data, he would like uh, at random replace 15% of the um, variables with a different row. Uh, so each row now would represent like a, a mix of like 80%, 85% of the original row, but 15% randomly selected from a different row. Um, and so this was a way of like randomly changing the data a little bit. And then um, he used something called an autoencoder, which we will probably won't study until part two of the deep learning course, but the basic idea of an autoencoder is your dependent variable is the same as your independent variable. So in other words, you try to predict your input, which obviously is trivial if you're allowed to, like, like you know, the identity transform, for example, trivially predicts the input. But the trick with an autoencoder is to have less activations in at least one of your layers than your input, right? So if your input was like a hundred dimensional vector and you put it through a 100 pi 10 matrix to create 10 activations and then had to recreate the original hundred long vector from that, then you've basically you had to have compressed it effectively. And so it turns out that um, that kind of neural network um, you know, is forced to find Correlations and features and interesting relationships in the data even when it's not labeled um, So he used that rather than doing any he didn't do any hand engineering. He just used an autoencoder um, So, you know, these are some interesting kind of directions that if you keep going with your machine learning studies, you know, particularly if you Do part two of the deep learning course next year um, you'll you'll learn about um, and uh, You can kind of see how Feature engineering is going away, and this was just yeah, an hour ago. So this is very recent news indeed. But it's one of this is one of the most important breakthroughs I've seen in a long time. Um, okay, so uh, we were working through um, a simple logistic regression trained with uh, SGD for MNIST. And here's the summary of where we got to We have nearly built a module uh, a Model a module and a training loop from scratch and we were going to kind of try and finish that and after we finish that I'm then going to go through this entire notebook backwards Right so having gone like top to bottom we're then going to go back through bottom to top right? so um, You know this was that little uh, handwritten nn.module <laughs> Class we created, uh, we defined our loss, we defined our learning rate, and we defined our optimizer. And this is the thing that we're going to try and write by hand in a moment. Um, so that stuff, that and that, we're dealing with from PyTorch, but that we've written ourselves, and this we've written ourselves. So the basic idea was we're going to go through some number of epochs. So let's go through one epoch, right? And we're going to keep track of how much. For each mini batch, what was the loss so that we can report it at the end? Um, we're going to turn our training data loader into an iterator 
so that we can loop through it, loop through every mini batch. And so now we can go and go ahead and say for tensor in uh, the length of the data loader, and then we can call next to grab the next independent variables and the dependent variables from our data loader, from that iterator. Okay. So then remember we can then pass the x tensor into our model by calling the model as if it was a function. Um, but first of all, we have to turn it into a variable. Um, last week we were typing variable blah dot CUDA to turn it into a variable. A shorthand for that is just the capital V. Right? So capital T for a tensor, capital B for a V for a variable. That's just a shortcut in fast AI. Okay? So that returns our predictions. And so the next thing we needed was to calculate our loss, um, because we can't calculate the derivatives of the loss if we haven't calculated the loss. So the loss takes the predictions and the actuals. Okay, so the actuals again are the the y tensor, and again we have to turn that into a variable. Now, can anybody remind me what a variable is and why we would want to use a variable here? Um, I think once you turn it into a variable, then it tracks it, so then you can do it backward on it, so you can. And, do and what, sorry, when you turn a variable, it. Uh, it can track like its process of like you know as you add the function as the functions start getting layered within each other, it can track it and then when you do backward on it, it back propagates and does the yeah gradient boosting right or so great boosting yeah right so a variable keeps um, track of all of the steps to get computed, um, and so there's actually a fantastic tutorial uh, on the PyTorch website. So on the um, PyTorch website, there's a tutorials section, and there's a tutorial there about Autograd. Autograd is the name of the automatic differentiation package that comes with PyTorch, and it's a, it's an implementation of automatic differentiation. And so the variable class is really the key, the key class here, because that's the thing that makes turns a tensor into something where we can keep track of its gradients. Um, so basically, here they show how to create. A variable do an operation to a variable and then you can go back and actually look at the grad function which is the the function that it's keeping track of uh, basically to calculate the gradient right so as we do more and more operations to this very vari variable and the variables calculated from that variable it keeps keeping track of it so later on we can go dot backward and then print dot grad and find out the gradient Right, and so you notice we never defined the gradient. We just defined it as being x plus two squared times three, whatever, and it it can calculate the gradient. Okay, so that's why we need to turn that into a variable. So L is now um, a variable containing the loss. So it contains a single number for this mini batch. Which is the loss for this mini batch, um, but it's not just a number; it's a it's a number as a variable, so it's a number that knows how it was calculated, right? So we're going to append that loss to our array just so we can get the average of it later, basically. Um, and now we're going to calculate the gradient. So L dot backward is the thing that says um, uh, calculate the gradient. So remember when you, we call the the network it's actually calling our forward function so that's like cut go through it forward and then backward is like using the chain rule to calculate the gradients backwards okay and then this is the thing we're about to write which is update the weights based on the gradients and the learning rate okay uh, zero grad will explain when we write this out by hand okay um, and so then at the end we can turn our validation data loader into an iterator and we can then go through its length, grabbing each um, x and y out of that, and asking for the score, which we defined up here to be equal to which thing did you predict, which thing was actual, and so check whether they're equal, right? And then the mean of that is going to be our accuracy. Okay? Uh, could you pass that over to Chen Shi? 
what's the advantage that you uh, convert it into an iterator rather than like use normal, I don't know, Python loop or... Uh, We're using a normal Python loop. Yeah. So it's still, a, this is a normal Python loop. So the question really is like, compared to what, right? So like, the alternative perhaps you're thinking of would be like, we could use like a something like a list with an indexer. Indexing, okay, yeah. so, you know, the problem there is that we want, um, there's a few things, I mean, one key one is we want each time we grab a new mini batch, we want it to be random, we want a different, different shuffled thing. So this, you can actually kind of iterate from forever, you know, you can loop through it as many times as you like. So uh, uh, there's this kind of idea, it's called different things in different languages. But a, a lot of languages will call it like stream processing, and it's this basic idea that rather than saying I want the third thing or the ninth thing, it's just like I want the next thing, right? It's great for like network programming, it's like grab the next thing from the network, uh, it's great for um, uh, UI programming, it's like grab the next event where somebody clicked a button, it also turns out to be great for um, this kind of numeric programming, so it's like I just want the next batch of data. Um, it means that the data, like can be kind of arbitrarily long because we're just grabbing one piece at a time. Um, yeah, so you know, I mean, and also, I, mean, I guess the short answer is because it, it's how PyTorch works. PyTorch, that PyTorch's data loaders are designed to be called in this way. And then, so Python has this concept of a generator, um, which is like an, an, an <laughs> different type of generator. I wonder if this is going to be a snake generator or a computer generator. Okay, um, a generator is uh, a way that you can create a function that, as it says, behaves like an iterator. So, like Python has recognized that this stream processing approach to programming is like super handy and helpful and supports it everywhere. So basically, anywhere that you use a for in loop, anywhere you use a, a list comprehension. Um, those things can always be generators or, or iterators, so by programming this way we just get a lot of um, flexibility, I guess. Does that sound about right, Terence? You're the programming language expert. Did you? Yeah, I was going to say something Do you want to grab that box so we can hear? So Terence actually does programming languages for a living, so we should ask him. <laughs> yeah, I mean the short answer is what you said. Uh, you might say something about space, but in this case that all that data has to be in memory anyway, because we've got. No, it doesn't have to be in memory. So, um, in fact, most of the you time mean, we could pull a mini batch from something. In fact, most of the time with PyTorch, the mini batch will be read from like separate images spread over your disk uh, on demand. So most say, of the okay. time, it's not in yeah. memory. But in in general, you want to keep as, as little in memory as possible uh -huh. at a time. And so the idea of stream processing also is great because you can do compositions. You can pipe the data to a different machine. You can yeah. Yeah, the composition is great. You can grab grab the next thing from here and then send it off to the next stream, which can then grab it and do something else. Yeah. Which you guys all recognize, of course, from the command line pipes and uh, redirection. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thanks, Terence. Um, the benefit of working with people that actually know what they're talking about. Uh, all right. So let's now um, take that and uh, get rid of the optimizer. Okay. So the only thing that we're going to be left with is the negative log likelihood loss function, um, which we could also replace. Actually, we have a implementation of that from scratch that Yannette wrote in the um, in the notebooks. So uh, it's only one line of code, as we learned earlier. You can do it with a single if statement. Okay. Um, so I don't know why I was so lazy as to include this. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to again grab this module that we've written ourselves, the logistic regression module. We're going to have one epoch again. We're going to loop through each thing in our iterator again. We're going to grab our independent and dependent variable for the mini batch again. Pass it into our network again. Calculate the loss. So this is all the same as before. But now we're going to get rid of this optimizer dot step, and we're going to do it by hand. So the basic uh, trick is, um, as I mentioned, we're not going to do the calculus by hand, so we'll call L backward to calculate the gradients automatically, uh, and that's going to fill in our weight matrix. So do you remember when we created our, um, let's go back and look at the code for, um, here's that module we built, so the weight matrix for the, for the um, linear layer weights we called L1W, 
and for the bias we called L1B. All right, so they, they were the attributes we created. Um, so um, I've just put them into things called W and B just to save some typing basically. So W is our weights, B is our biases. And so the weights, and remember the weights are a variable, and to get the tensor out of the variable we have to use dot data. Right? So we want to update the actual tensor that's in this variable. So we say weights dot data minus equals, so we want to go in the opposite direction to the gradient. The gradient tells us which way is up, and we want to go down. Um, whatever is currently in the gradients times the learning rate. So that is the formula for gradient descent. Right? So as you can see, it's it's like as as easy a thing as you can possibly imagine. It's like literally update the weights to be equal uh, to be equal to whatever they are now minus the gra uh, the gradients times the learning rate, and do the same thing for the bias. Does anybody have any questions about that step in terms of like why we do it or how? It, did you have a question? Do you want to grab that? No, that step. But when we do the uh, next stop DL, uh, the so next here. Yes, mm. yes. Uh, so, so when we reach the end of the loop, how do we grab the next element? Um, so this is going through each um, uh, each index in range of length. So this is going zero, one, two, three. Uh, at the end of this loop, it's going to print out the mean of the validation set. Go back to the start of the epoch. At which point it's going to recreate a new a new iterator. Okay, so basically behind the scenes in Python, when you call iter uh, on on this, it basically tells it to like reset its state to create a new iterator. And if you're interested in how that works, um, the um, the code is all um, you know available for you to look at. Um, so we could look at like MD dot train DL is a fast AI dot data set dot model data loader So we could like take a look at the code of that So we could take a look at the code of that And see exactly how it's being built right and so you can see here that here's the next function right which basically is keeping track of how many times it's been through in the self dot I Uh, and here's the iter function, which is the thing that gets called when you when you create a new iterator And you can see it's basically passing it off to something else Which is a type data loader and then you can check out data loader if you're interested to see how that's implemented um, as well um, So the data loader that we wrote uh, Basically uses multi threading to allow it to have multiple of these going on at the same time um, uh, It's actually a great it's really simple. It's like it's only about a screen full of code Um, so if you're interested in simple multi-threaded programming, it's a good thing to look at uh, Okay now um, Oh, yes Why have you wrapped this in a four epoch in range one since that'll only run once <laughs> because um, In real life we would normally be running multiple epochs okay. um, So like in this case because it's a linear model it actually basically trains to As good as it's going to get in one epoch. So if I type three here it actually um, It actually won't really improve after the first epoch much at all as you can see right um, But when we go back up to the top, we're going to look at some slightly deeper and more interesting Versions which will take more epochs. So you know if I was turning this into a into a function, you know I'd be going like you know def train model And one of the things you would pass in is like number of epochs kind of a thing um, Okay, great So one thing to remember is that um, when you're you know creating these neural network layers um, and remember like uh, This is just as far as PyTorch is concerned. This is just a it's an NN dot module It could be a we could be using it as a layer. We could be using it as a function We could be using it as a neural net PyTorch doesn't think of those as different things, right? So this could be a layer inside some other network, right? Um, so how do gradients work? So if you've got a layer which remember is just a bunch of we can think of it basically as its activations, right? or some activations that get computed through some 
um, either nonlinear activation function or through some linear function and from that layer we it's very likely that we're then like let's say putting it through a matrix product right to create some new layer and so each one of these so if we were to grab like one of these activations right is actually going to be um, used to calculate every one of these outputs right and so if you want to calculate the um, the derivative you have to know how this weight matrix impacts that output and that output and that output and that output right and then you have to add all of those together to find like the total impact of this you know across all of its outputs and so that's why in PyTorch you have to tell it when to set the gradients to zero right because the idea is that you know you could be like having lots of different loss functions or lots of different outputs in your next activate uh, set of activations or whatever all adding up increasing or decreasing your gradients right so you basically have to say okay this is a new calculation um, reset okay so here is where we do that right so before we do l dot backward we say reset okay so let's take our weights let's take the gradients let's take the tensor that they point to and then zero underscore does anybody remember from last week what underscore does as a suffix in PyTorch yeah Uh, I forgot the language, but basically it uh, changes it within the place right there. The language is in place. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, exactly. So it, it it sounds like a minor technicality, but it's super useful to, to remember. Every function pretty much has an underscore version suffix, which does it in place. Uh, yeah, so normally zero uh, returns a, um, a tensor of zeros of a particular size. So zero underscore means replace the contents of this with a bunch of zeros okay all right so that's um that's it right so that's like sgd from scratch and if i get rid of my menu bar we can officially say it fits within a screen okay so um of course we haven't got our definition of logistic regression here that's another half a screen but basically there's there's not much to it yes Vesh. Um, so later on, if we have to do this more, the gradient, is it because you might find like a wrong minima, local minima, is that why? So you have to kick it out, and that's why you have to do it multiple times when the surfaces get more complicated. Why do you need multiple epochs? Is that yeah. your question? Well, I mean, a simple way to answer that would be, let's say our learning rate was tiny, right? Um, then it's just not going to get very far, right? There's nothing that says going through one epoch is enough to get you all the way there um, so then you'd be like okay well let's increase our learning rate and it's like yeah sure we'll increase our learning rate but who's to say that the highest learning rate that learns stably is is enough to learn this as well as it can be learned and for most data sets for most architectures one epoch is very rarely enough to get you to the best result you can get to um, you know linear models are just They're, they're very nicely behaved, you know, so you can often use higher learning rates and learn them more quickly. Also, they they don't you can't like generally get as good an accuracy, so there's not as far to take them either. Um, so yeah, doing one epoch is going to be the rarity. All right, so let's go backwards. So going backwards, we're basically going to say, all right, let's not write those two lines again and again and again. Let's not write those three lines again and again and again. Let's have somebody do that for us, right? So that's like that's the only difference between that version and this version is rather than saying dot zero ourselves, rather than saying minus gradient times LR ourselves, these are wrapped up for us. Okay. Um, there is another wrinkle here, which is um, this approach to updating the um, the weights is actually pretty inefficient. Um, it doesn't take advantage of um, momentum um, and curvature uh, and so um, in the DL course we learn about how to do momentum from scratch 
as well. Okay, so uh, if we actually just use plain old SGD, um, then you'll see that this learns much slower. So now that I've typed just plain old SGD here, this is now literally doing exactly the same thing um, as our slow version, so I have to increase the learning rate. Okay, there we go. So this this is now the same as the the one we wrote by hand. Uh, so then, all right, um, <clears throat> let's do a little bit more stuff uh, automatically. Um, let's not, you know, given that every time we train something, we have to loop through epoch, loop through batch, do forward, get the loss, zero the gradient, do backward. Do a step of the optimizer. Let's put all that in a function. Okay, and that function is called fit. All right, there it is. Okay, so let's take a look at fit. Fit. Go through each epoch. Go through each batch. Do one step. Keep track of the loss, and at the end calculate the validation. All right, and so then uh, step So if you're interested in looking at this this stuff's all inside fastai.model And so here is step Right, um, zero the gradients, calculate the loss. Remember, um, PyTorch tends to call it criterion rather than loss. Right, do backward. Um, and then there's something else we haven't learned here, but we do learn the deep learning course, which is gradient clipping. So you can ignore that. Right. So you can see now, like all the stuff that we've learned, when you look inside the actual frameworks, that's the code you see. Okay. Um, so that's what fit does. And so then the next step would be like, okay, well, this idea of like having some weights and a bias and doing a matrix product in addition, let's put that in a function. This thing of doing the log softmax, let's put that in a function. And then the very idea of like first doing this and then doing that, this idea of like chaining functions together, let's put that into a function. And that finally gets us to that. Okay, so sequential simply means do this function, take the result, send it to this function, etc. Right? Uh, and linear means create the weight matrix, create the biases. Okay? Uh, so that's that's it, right? Um, so we can then, you know, as we started to talk about, like turn this into a deep neural network um, by saying you know, rather than sending this straight off into uh, uh, 10 activations, let's let's put it into say 100 activations. We could pick whatever number we like. Um, put it through a ReLU to make it nonlinear. Put it through another linear layer, another ReLU, and then our final output with our final activation function. Right, and so this is now um, a deep network. So we could fit that, and this time now, because it's like deeper, um, I'm actually going to run a few more epochs, right? And you can see the accuracy increasing, right? So if you try and increase the learning rate here, it's like 0.1 um, further, uh, it actually starts to become unstable. Um, now I'll show you a trick. Um, this is called learning rate annealing, and um, the trick is this. When you're trying to fit to a function, right, you've been taking a few steps. Step, step, step. As you get close to the middle, like get close to the bottom, your steps probably want to become smaller, right? Otherwise, what tends to happen is you start finding you're doing this, right? And so you can actually see it here, right? It got 93, 94 and a bit, 94, 6. 
94.8, like it's kind of starting to flatten out. Right? Now that could be because it's kind of done as well as it can, or it could be that it's kind of going backwards and forwards. So what is a good idea is, is later on in training is to decrease your learning rate and to take smaller steps. Okay, that's called learning rate annealing. So there's a function in um, FastAI called set learning rates. You can pass in your optimizer and your new learning rate, and you know, see if that helps. Right, and very often it does. Um, about an, well, about an order of magnitude. Um, in the deep learning course, we learn a much much better technique than this to do this all automatically and at a more granular level. But if you're doing it by hand, you know, like an order of magnitude at a time is what people generally do. Um, so you'll see people in papers talk about um, learning rate schedules. Um, this is like a learning rate schedule. So with this schedule, uh, just a moment, Erica, I'll we'll just uh, come to Ernest first, uh, has got us to 97, right? And I tried um, uh, kind of going further, and we don't seem to be able to get much better than that. So yeah, so here we've got something where we can get 97% accuracy. Yes, Erica. So it seems like you change the learning rate um, to something very small. Ten so times smaller than we started with. So we had point right. one. Now it's point oh one. Yep. Um, but that makes the whole model train really slow. So I was wondering if you can make it so that it changes dynamically as it approaches closer to the minima. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So so that's some of the stuff we learn in the deep learning course. Is okay. these more advanced approaches. Yeah. Devish. So how it is different from using Adam optimizer or something? That, that's you... the kind of stuff we can do. I mean, you still need annealing. Um, as I say, we do this kind of stuff in the deep learning course. So for now, we're just going to stick to standard SGD. Um, I had a question about the data loading. Yeah. Um, I, I know it's a fast AI function, but could you go into a little bit of detail of how it's creating batches, how it's loading mm -hmm. data, and, and how it's making those decisions? Sure. Um, It'd be good to ask that on Monday night so we can talk about it in detail in the deep learning class okay. um, But let's let's do the quick version here um, so basically um, There's a really nice design in PyTorch um, Where they basically say let's let's create a thing called a data set Right and a data set is basically something that looks like a list it has a length right um, And so that's like how many images are in the data set and it has the ability to Index into it like a list right so if you had like D equals data set You can do length D and you can do D of some index, right? That's basically all a data set Is as far as PyTorch is concerned and so you start with a data set. So it's like okay uh, D3 gives you the third image, you know or whatever And so then the idea is that you can take a data set and you can pass that into a constructor for a data loader And that gives you something which is now um, iterable right so you can now say iter DL and that's something that you can call next on And what that now is going to do is um, if uh, when you do this you can choose to have shuffle on or shuffle off shuffle on means Give me random mini batch shuffle off means go through it sequentially um, And so um, What the data loader does now when you say next is it basically assuming you said shuffle equals true is it's going to grab You know if you've got a batch size of 64 64 random integers between zero and length and call this 64 times to get 64 different items and jam them together um, so fast AI uses the exact same terminology and the exact same API um, uh, We just uh, do some of the details differently so specifically particularly with computer vision um, You often want to do a lot of pre -pro uh, not so much pre-processing uh, Data augmentation like flipping changing the colors a little bit rotating those turn out to be really computationally expensive Even just reading the JPEGs turns out to be computationally expensive um, So PyTorch uses an approach where it fires off multiple processes to do that in parallel uh, Whereas the fast AI library instead does something called multi-threading, um, which is a much uh, can be a much faster way of doing it um, Yes, you're So 
uh, an epoch is a real epoch in the sense that all of the elements, so it's a shuffle at the beginning of the epoch, something like that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, not all libraries work the same way. Some do sampling with replacement, uh, some don't. Um, we actually, the Fast AI library hands off the shuffling off to the to the actual PyTorch version, and I believe the PyTorch version, yeah, actually shuffles and an epoch covers everything once, uh, I believe. Um, okay, now the thing is when you start to get these bigger networks, um, potentially you're getting quite a few parameters, right? So um, I won't ask you to calculate how many parameters there are, but let's let's remember here we've got uh, 28 by 28 input into 100 output, and then 100 into 100, and then 100 into 10, right? And then for each of those we've got weights and biases. So we can actually do this. Net.parameters returns a list where each element of the list is a matrix, or actually a tensor, of the parameters for that, not just for that layer, but if it's a layer with both weights and biases, that would be two parameters. right? So basically returns us a list of all of the tensors containing the, um, the parameters. Um, num elements in PyTorch tells you how, how big that is. Right? So if I run this, uh, here is the number of parameters in each layer. So I've got 784 inputs, and the first layer has 100 outputs, so therefore the first weight matrix is of size 78,400. Okay? Uh, and the first bias vector is of size 100. Okay? And then the next one is 100 by 100, okay? and there's 100, and then the next one is 100 by 10, and then there's my bias. Okay? So there's the number of elements in each layer, and if I add them all up, it's nearly a hundred thousand, okay? Um, and so I'm possibly at risk of overfitting here, right? So we might want to think about using regularization. So uh, a really simple, common approach to regularization in all of machine learning um, is something called uh, L2 regularization. And it's super important, super handy, you can use it with just about anything, right? And the basic idea... Um, anyway, um, so um, L2 regularization, the basic idea is this. Normally we'd say our loss is equal to... let's just do RMSE to keep things kind of simple. Uh, it's equal to our predictions minus our actuals, you know, squared, and then we sum them up, take the average, take the square root. Okay, so what if we then want to say, you know what, like, if I've got lots and lots of parameters, don't use them unless they're really helping enough, right? Like if you've got a million parameters and you only really needed 10 parameters to be useful, just use 10, right? So how could we like tell the loss function to do that? And so basically what we want to say is, hey, if a parameter is zero, that's no problem. It's like it doesn't exist at all. So let's penalize a parameter for not being zero. Right? So what would be a way we could measure that? How can we like calculate how unzero our parameters are? Uh, can you pass that to Chen Shi, please, Ernest? You calculate the average of all the parameters. That's my first one. Can't quite be the average. Uh, close. Oh, yes, Taylor. Yeah. Yes, yeah, you figured it out. Okay. <laughs> I, well, I think. So I, I think if we like, if, assuming all of our data has been uh, normalized, standardized, however you want to call it, we want to check that they're like significantly different from zero, right? Would that be not the, the data? The the parameters. The parameters the rather would be significantly different. And the from parameters zero. don't have to be normalized or anything. They're just calculated. Right. Yes. Yeah, so it, significantly different from zero. Right. I suppose I just said, said, Matt, assuming that the data has been normalized okay. so that we can compare them on the same Oh yeah, scale. got it. Yeah, right. right. Um, and then those that are not significantly different from zero, we can probably okay. just drop. And I think Chen Shi is going to tell us how to do that. You yeah. just figured it out, right? The mean of the absolute value. Of the Could do that. That would be called L1, which is great. So L1 would be the absolute value of the weights average. Right. L2 
is actually the sum. S square root sum of squares. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So we just take the we can just we don't even have to square root. So we just take the squares of the weights themselves, and then like we want to be able to say like okay, um, how much do we want to penalize not being zero? Right? Because if we actually don't have that many parameters, we don't want to regularize much at all. If we've got heaps, we do want to regularize a lot, right? So then we put a um, a parameter here, right? Except I have a rule in my classes, which is never to use Greek letters. So normally people use alpha. I'm going to use a. Okay. So um, so this is some number which you often see something around kind of one e neg six to one e neg four. Ish, right? Um, now we actually don't care about the loss. When you think about it, we don't actually care about the loss, other than like maybe to print it out. What we actually care about is the gradient of the loss. Okay, so the gradient of that, right, is that. Right, so <clears throat> there are two ways to do this. We can actually modify our loss function to add in this square penalty, or we could modify that thing where we said weights equals weights minus gradient times learning rate to subtract that as well. Right? Well, actually, sorry, to add that as well, um, and. These are roughly these are kind of basically equivalent, but they have different names. This is called L2 regularization, right? This is called weight decay. So in the neural network literature, you know, that version kind of was the, how it was first posed in the neural network literature, whereas this other version is kind of um, how it was posed in the statistics literature. And yeah, you know, they're they're equivalent. Um, As we talked about in the deep learning class, it turns out they're not exactly equivalent because when you have things like momentum and atom, it can behave differently. And two weeks ago, a researcher um, figured out a way to actually um, do proper weight decay in modern optimizers. And one of our fast AI students just implemented that in the fast AI library. So fast AI is now the first library to actually support this properly. Um, so anyway, so for now, let's do the um, The version which um, PyTorch calls weight decay, um, but actually it turns out, uh, based on this paper two weeks ago, is actually L2 regularization. It's not quite correct, but it's close enough. So here we can say weight decay is 1 e neg 3. So this is going to set our, const, our, our penalty multiplier a to 1 e neg 3, and it's going to add that to the loss function. Okay, and so let's make a copy of these cells just so we can compare. Hope this actually works. Okay, and we'll set this running. Okay, so this is now optimizing. Oh, except um, if you actually. So uh, I've made a mistake here, which is I didn't rerun this cell. This is an important thing to kind of remember. Since I didn't run this rerun this cell uh, here, when it created the optimizer and said net dot parameters, it started with the parameters that I had already trained. Right, so I actually hadn't recreated my network. Okay, so I actually need to go back and rerun this cell first to recreate the network uh, then go through and run this Okay, there we go, so let's see what happens So you might notice some notice something kind of kind of counterintuitive here Which is that That's our training error, right? Now you would expect our training error with regularization to be worse. Does that make sense, right? Because we're like we're, we're penalizing parameters that specifically can make it better, and yet actually it started out better, not worse. So why could that be? So the reason that can happen is that. If you have a function that looks like that, right? It takes potentially a really long time to train. Or else, if you have a function that kind of looks more like that, it's going to train a lot more quickly. 
And there are certain things that you can do which sometimes just like can take a function That's kind of horrible and make it less horrible and it's sometimes weight decay can actually Make your functions a little more nicely behaved and that's actually happened here So like I just mentioned that to say like don't let that confuse you right like weight decay really does penalize the training set and look so strictly speaking um, The final number we get to for the training set shouldn't end up be be being better, but it can train sometimes more quickly, right? Um, uh, yes, can you pass it to Chenchi? I don't get it. Okay. Why making it faster? Like the time matters? Like the training time matters? Um, no, it's, it's, this is after one epoch, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So after one epoch... Um, And congratulations for saying I don't get it. That's like the best thing anybody can say, you know, so helpful um, This here was our training without weight decay Okay, and this here is our training with weight decay Okay, so this is not related to time. This is related to just an epoch right after one epoch My claim was that you would expect the training set all other things being equal to have a worse loss with weight decay because we're penalizing it You know this has no penalty. This has a penalty. So the thing with the penalty should be worse and I'm saying oh, it's not that's weird right and so the reason it's not is because in a single epoch It matters a lot as to whether you're trying to optimize something that's very bumpy or whether you're trying to optimize something that's kind of nice and smooth If you're trying to optimize something that's really bumpy like imagine in some high-dimensional space, right? You end up kind of rolling around through all these different tubes and tunnels and stuff, you know Or else if it's just smooth you just go boom Right, it's like imagine a marble rolling down a hill where one of them you've got like Um, it's a called Lombard Street in San Francisco. It's like backwards forwards backwards forwards It takes a long time to drive down the road, right? Where else you know if you kind of took a motorbike and just went straight over the top you just go boom, right? So So whether uh, so kind of the shape of the loss function surface You know impacts or kind of defines how easy it is to optimize and therefore how far can it get in a single epoch and based on these results it would appear That weight decay here has made it this, this function easier to optimize so um, just to make sure it's The penalizing is making the optimizer more than likely to reach the global minimum rather than no I wouldn't say that um, my claim actually is that at the end It's probably going to be less good on the training set and indeed this does look to be the case at the end after five epochs our training set is now worse With weight decay now, that's what I would expect right? I would expect like if you actually find like I never use the term global optimum because It's just not something we have any guarantees about we don't really care about we just care like where do we get to after a certain number of epochs? Um, we hope that we found somewhere that's like a good solution and so by the time we get to like a good solution the training set with weight decay the loss is worse because it's penalty right, but On the validation set the loss is better Right because we penalized the training set in order to kind of try and create something that generalizes better So we've got more param you know the, the parameters that are kind of pointless are now zero and it generalizes better Right, so so all we're saying is that it just tr got to a good point After one epoch is really all we're saying So is it always true? I'm no No, I uh, if you if by it you mean just weight decay you always make the function surface smoother um, No, it's not always true, but it's like it's worth remembering that If you're having trouble training a function adding a little bit of weight decay may may help And the what so by regularizing the parameters What it does is it smoothens out the loss surf loss function. I mean, it's not it's not why we do it. You know, the reason why we do it is because we want to penalize things that aren't zero to say like 
don't make this parameter a high number unless it's really helping the loss a lot, right? Set it to zero if you can, because setting as many parameters to zero as possible means that it's going to generalize better, right? It's like the same as having a smaller network, right? So that's that's we do that's why we do it, um, but it, it it can change how it learns as well. So let's um, okay. Just one moment, Erica. So I just wanted to check how we actually went here. So after the second epoch, yeah. So you can see here it really has helped, right? After the second epoch, before we got to ninety-seven percent accuracy, now we're nearly up to about ninety-eight percent accuracy, right? And you can see that the loss was 0.08 versus 0.13, right? So adding regularization has allowed us to find a you know three percent versus two percent, so like a fifty percent better. Solution. Yes, Erica. So there are two pieces to this, right? One is L2 regularization and the weight decay. Right? No, they're the they're, so they're my the claim was they're the same thing, okay. right? So weight decay is the version if you just take the derivative of L2 regularization, you get weight decay. So you can implement it either by changing the loss function with a with a squared loss uh, penalty, or you can implement it by adding. Um, the weights themselves uh, as part of the the gradient. Okay. Yeah, I was just uh, going to finish the questions. Yes, uh, can you pass that to Devesh? Can we use regularization and convolution layer as well? Absolutely. So a convolution layer just is is weights. So, yeah. Okay. Um, Jeremy, can you explain why you thought you needed weight decay in this particular problem? Um. Not easily. I mean, other than to say it's something that I would always try. You're always feeding thunder. Well, maybe, maybe yeah. I mean, okay. So uh, even if I, yeah, okay, that's a good point, Yannette. So um, if if my training loss was higher than my validation loss, then I'm underfitting, right? So there's definitely no point regularizing, right? If like. That would always be a bad thing. That would always mean you need like more parameters in your model. Um, in this case, I'm I'm overfitting. That doesn't necessarily mean regularization will help, but it's certainly worth trying. Thank you, Annette. That's a great point. There's one more question. Yep. Tyler, do you want to pass it over there? Uh, so, how do you choose the optimal number of epoch? Um. Uh, you do my deep learning course. <laughs> it, it's a it's that's a long story and uh, lots of it, lots of. You do it. Do you do it by heuristically uh, or is there any? any uh... It's a bit of both. Okay. Bit, uh, we just don't. As I say, we don't have time to cover best practices in this class. We're going to learn the kind of fundamentals. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's uh, take a six-minute break and come back at eleven ten. All right. So something that we cover in great detail in the deep learning course, but it's like really important to mention here is that is that the secret, in my opinion, to kind of modern machine learning techniques, is to massively overparameterize the solution to your problem, right? Like as we've done here, you know, we've got like a hundred thousand weights when we only had a small number of twenty-eight by twenty-eight images. Um, and then use regularization. Okay, it's like the direct opposite of how nearly all statistics and learning was done for decades before, um, and still most kind of like senior lecturers at most universities in most areas have, have have this background where they've learned the correct way to build a model is to like have as few parameters as possible, right? And so. Hopefully we've learned two things so far. You know, one is we can build um, very accurate models even when they have lots and lots of parameters. Like a random forest has a lot of parameters, and uh, uh, you know this here deep network has a lot of parameters, and they can be accurate, right? Um, and we can do that by either using bagging or by using regularization. Okay, and regularization in neural nets means either Weight decay, also known as kind of L2 regularization, or dropout, which we 
won't worry too much about here. Um, so like it's a it's a very different way of thinking about building useful models. And like I just wanted to kind of warn you that once you leave this classroom, like even possibly when you go to the next faculty member's talk, like there'll be people at USF as well who are entirely trained in the world of like models with small numbers of parameters. You know, your your next boss is very likely to have been trained in the world of like models with small numbers of parameters. Um, the idea that they are somehow more pure or easier or better or more interpretable or whatever. Um, I I am convinced that that is not true, probably not ever true, uh, certainly very rarely true, um, and that actually um, models with lots of parameters can be extremely interpretable, as we learnt from our whole lesson of random forest interpretation. Um, you can use most of the same techniques with neural nets, but with neural nets they're even easier, right? Remember how we did feature importance by randomizing a column to see how changes in that column would impact the output? Well, that's just like a kind of dumb way of calculating its gradient. How much does varying this input change the output? With a neural net we can actually calculate its gradient. Right? So with PyTorch you could actually say what's the gradient of the output with respect to this column? Right? Uh, you can do the same kind of thing to do um, a partial dependence plot with a neural net. Um, and you know, I'll mention for those of you interested in, in making a real impact, nobody's written basically any of these things for neural nets. Right? So that, that, that whole area needs like libraries to be written, blog posts to be written, you know, some papers have been written, but only in very narrow domains like computer vision. As far as I know, nobody's written the paper saying, here's how to do structured data, neural networks, you know, interpretation methods. Um, so it's a really exciting, big uh, area. Um, so what we're going to do, though, um, is we're going to start uh, with uh, applying this um, uh, with a simple linear model. Um, and this is mildly terrifying for me because we're going to do NLP and our NLP faculty expert is in the room, so David, just yell at me if I screw this up too badly. Um, uh, and so NLP refers to, um, you know, any, any kind of modeling where we're working with, with natural language text, right? And it, interestingly enough, um, we're going to look at a situation where a linear model is pretty close to the state of the art for solving a particular problem. Um, it's actually something where um, I actually surpassed the state of the art in this using a recurrent neural network a few weeks ago, um, uh, but this is actually going to show you pretty close to the state of art with, with a um, linear model. Uh, we're going to be working with the IMDB, IMDB uh, data set. So this is a data set of movie reviews. Um, you can download it by following these steps. Um, and um, once you download it, you'll see that you've got a train and a test directory. And uh, in your train directory, you'll see there's a negative and a positive directory. And in your positive directory, you'll see there's a bunch of text files. And here's an example of a text file. So somehow we've managed to pick out a story of a man who has unnatural feelings for a pig as our first choice. That wasn't intentional, but it'll be fine. Um, so uh, we're going to look at these movie reviews. Um, and for each one, we're going to look to see whether they were positive or negative. So they've been put into one of these folders. They were downloaded from, from IMDB, the, the, the movie database and review site. Uh, the ones that were strongly positive went in positive, strongly negative went in negative, and the rest they didn't label at all. So these are only highly polarized reviews. So in this case, you know, uh, we have an insane violent mob, which unfortunately is too absurd, too off-putting, those in the area will be turned off. So the label for this was a zero, which is uh, negative. Okay, so this is a negative review. So, um, in the FastAI library, there's lots of little functions and classes to help with 
most kinds of domains that you do machine learning on. For NLP, one of the simple things we have is text from folders. That's just going to go ahead and go through and find all of the folders in here uh, with these names and create a labeled data set. Uh, and you know, don't let these things ever stop you from understanding what's going on behind the scenes. Right? We can grab its source code, and as you can see, it's tiny. You know, it's like five lines. Okay, so I, I don't like to write these things out in full, you know, but hide them behind little functions so you can reuse them. But basically, it's just going to go through each directory, and then within that, sorry, go through, yeah, go through each directory, um, and then go through each uh, file in that directory, uh, and then stick that into um, this array of texts and figure out what folder it's in and stick that into the array of labels. Okay, so. That's how we uh, basically end up with something where we have an array of the reviews and an array of the labels. Okay, so that's our data. So our job will be to take that and to predict that. Okay, and the way we're going to do it is we're going to throw away like all of the interesting stuff about language, which is the order in which the words are in. Right? Now this is very often not a good idea, um, but in this particular case it's going to turn out to work like not too badly. So let me show you what I mean by like throwing away the order of the words. Like normally the order of the words matters a lot. If you've got a not before something, then that not refers to that thing, right? So, but the thing is when in this case we're trying to predict whether something's positive or negative. If you see the word absurd appear a lot, right, then maybe that's a sign that this isn't very good. Um, uh, so, you know, cryptic, maybe that's a sign that it's not very good. So the idea is that we're going to turn it into something called a term document matrix, where for each document, i.e. each review, we're just going to create a list of what words are in it, rather than what order they're in. So let me give an example. Um, can you see this okay? Okay. So um, here are four movie reviews that I made up. Uh, This movie is good. The movie is good. They're both positive. This movie is bad. The movie is bad. They're both negative, right? So I'm going to turn this into a term document matrix. So the first thing I need to do is create something called a vocabulary. A vocabulary is a list of all the unique words that appear. Okay. So here's my vocabulary. This movie is good. The bad. That's all the words. Okay. And so now I'm going to take each one of my movie reviews and turn it into a vector. Of which words appear and how often do they appear, right? And in this case, none of my words appear twice. Um, so this movie is good has those four words in it, where else this movie is bad has those four words in it. Okay, so this is called a term document matrix, right? And this representation we call a bag of words representation. Right, so this here is a bag of words representation of the view of the review. It doesn't contain the order of the text anymore It's just a bag of the words what words are in it. It contains bad is Movie this okay, so that's the first thing we're going to do is we're going to turn it into a bag of words representation and the reason that this is uh, convenient for linear models is that this is a nice Rectangular matrix that we can like do math on Okay, and specifically we can do a logistic regression and that's what we're going to do is we're going to get to a point. We do a logistic regression Before we get there though, we're going to do something else which is called naive base Okay, so um, SK learn uh, Has something which will create a term document matrix for us. It's called count vectorizer. Okay, so we'll just use it now um, in NLP You have to turn your text into a list of words And that's called tokenization, okay? And that's actually non-trivial, because like if this was actually this movie is good, dot, right? Or if it was this movie is good, like how do you deal with like that punctuation? Or perhaps more interestingly, what if it was this movie isn't good, right? So um, how you Turn a piece of text into a list of tokens is called tokenization, right? And so a good tokenizer 
would turn this movie isn't good uh, into this. This space, quote, movie space, is space and good space. Right? So you can see in this version here, if I now split this on spaces, every token is either a single piece of punctuation, or like this suffix unt is considered like a word. Right? That's kind of like how we would probably want to tokenize that piece of text. Because you wouldn't want good full stop to be like an object, right? Because there's no concept of good full stop, right? Or double quote movie is not like an object. Right? So tokenization is something we hand off to a tokenizer. Uh, Fast.ai has a tokenizer in it that we can use. Um, so this is how we create our term document matrix with a tokenizer. Um, SKLearn has a pretty standard API, which is nice. I'm sure you've seen it a few times now before. Um, so once we've built some kind of model, we can kind of think of this as a model, just-ish. Um, this is just defining what it's going to do. We can call fit transform to to do that, right? So in this case, fit transform is going to create the vocabulary, okay, and create the term document matrix uh, based on the training set. Um, transform is a little bit different. That says use the previously fitted model, which in this case means use the previously created vocabulary. We wouldn't want the validation set and the training set to have, you know, the words in different orders in the matrices, right? Because then they'd like to have different meanings. So this is here saying use the same vocabulary to create a bag of words for the validation set. Could you pass that back, please? Uh, what if the validation set has different set of words other than training set? Yeah, that's a great question. So generally most uh, of these uh, kind of vocab creating approaches will have a special token for unknown um, Sometimes you can uh, you'll also say like hey if a word appears less than three times call it unknown um, But otherwise it's like yeah, if you see something you haven't seen before call it unknown So that would just become a column in the bag of words is is unknown uh, good question. All right, so when we create this uh, uh, Term document matrix of the training set we have 25,000 rows because there are 25,000 movie reviews um, And there are 75,132 columns What does that represent? What does that mean? There are 735,132. What can you pass that to Devesh? Uh, just a moment. Can you pass that to Devesh? All vocabulary Yeah, go on. What do you mean? So, like the the number of words, a uh, union of number of words. The, the the number of unique words. Yeah, exactly. Good. Okay. Now, most documents don't have most of these seventy-five thousand words, right? So we don't want to actually store that as a normal array in memory because it's going to be very wasteful. So instead, we store it as a sparse. Matrix, right? And what a sparse matrix does is it just stores it as something that says um, whereabouts are the non-zeros, right? So it says like, okay, term number, so uh, document number one, word number four uh, appears, and it has four of them, you know. Uh, document one, term number one hundred and twenty-four three. Uh, has that that appears and it's a one right and so forth. That's basically How it's stored. There's actually a number of different ways of storing um, And if you do Rachel's uh, computational linear algebra course You'll learn about the different types and why you choose them and how to convert and so forth But they're all kind of something like this right and you don't really on the whole have to worry about the details uh, the important thing to know is it's it's efficient Okay, and so we could grab the first review, right? And that gives us 75,000 long sparse one long one row long matrix, okay? With 93 stored elements. So in other words, 93 of those words are actually used in the first document, okay? We can have a look at the vocabulary by saying vectorizer.get feature names. That gives us the vocab. And so here's an example of a few of the elements of get feature names. Um, I didn't intentionally pick the one that had Aussie, but you know, that's the important words, obviously. Um, 
I haven't used the tokenizer here. I'm just bidding on space So this isn't quite the same as what the um, vectorizer did, but to simplify things um, um, Let's grab a set of all the lowercase words um, By making it a set we make them unique. So this is roughly the list of words that would appear right and that length is 91 uh, which is pretty similar to 93 and just the difference will be that I didn't use a real tokenizer. Yeah, right um, So that's basically all that's been done there. It's kind of created this unique list of words uh, and mapped them um, We could check by calling vectorizer dot vocabulary underscore to find the ID of a particular word So this is like the reverse map of this one, right? So this is like integer to word here is word to integer And so we saw absurd appear twice in the first document. So let's check train term doc 0 comma 1297 There it is as two Right or else unfortunately Aussie didn't appear in the unnatural relationship with a pig movie uh, So 0 comma 5,000 is zero Okay, so uh, That's that's our term document matrix uh, Yes So does it care about uh, the relative rela uh, relationship uh, between the words? As in the ordering the order, of the words? No, yeah. we've thrown away the orderings. That's why it's a bag of words okay. And I'm not claiming that this is like Necessarily a good idea. Uh, what I will say is that like The vast majority of NLP work that's been done over the last few decades generally uses this representation because we didn't really know much better um, Nowadays increasingly we're using recurrent neural networks instead which we'll learn about in our last Deep learning lesson of part one um, But sometimes this uh, representation works pretty well, and it's actually going to work pretty well in this case um, Okay, so um, and in fact, you know most um, like back when I was at fast mail my email company uh, a lot of the spam filtering we did used this next technique naive Bayes, which uses a bag of words approach just kind of like you know if you're getting a lot of Email containing the word Viagra and it's always been a spam and you never get email from your friends talking about Viagra Then it's very likely something that says Viagra regardless of the detail of the language is probably from a spammer All right, so that's the basic theory about like classification using a term document matrix. Okay, so let's talk about naive Bayes um, And here's the basic idea. We're going to start with our term document matrix All right and these first two is our corpus of positive reviews These next two is our corpus of negative reviews, and so here's our whole corpus of all reviews all right. So what I could do is now to create a probability uh, I'm going to call the as we tend to call these more generically features rather than words, right? This is a feature movie is a feature is is a feature, right? Um, so it's kind of mo more now like machine learning language a column is a feature we'll call those we often call those F in naive phase so we can basically say the probability That you would see the word this Given that the class is one given that it's a positive review is just the average of how often do you see this in the positive reviews Right now we've got to be a bit careful though because um, if you never ever see a particular word in a particular class, right? So if I've never received an email from a friend that said Viagra, right? That doesn't actually mean the probability of a, of a friend send me, sending me an email about Viagra is zero. It's not really zero, right? Uh, I, I, I hope I don't get an email, you know, from Terence tomorrow saying like, <laughs> Jeremy, you probably could use this, you know, <laughs> advertisement for Viagra, but you know it could happen, and you know, uh, you know, I'm sure it'd be in my best interest. <laughs> yeah. So, so what we do is we say, actually, what we've seen so far is not the full sample of everything that could happen. It's like a sample of what's happened so far. So let's assume that the next email you get actually does mention Viagra and every other possible word. Right, so basically we're, we're going to add a row of ones Okay, so that's like the email that contains every possible word so that way nothing's ever infinitely unlikely 
Okay, so I take the average of um, all of the um, times that this appears in my positive corpus plus the ones. Okay, so that's like the um, the probability that um, feature equals this appears in a document given that class equals one. And so not surprisingly, here's the same thing for probability that this feature this appears given class equals zero, right? Same calculation except for the zero rows. And obviously these are the same because this appears twice in the positives, sorry, once in the positives and once in the negatives. Okay? Let's just put this back to what it was. All right. Um, so we can do that for every feature uh, for every class. All right. So our trick now is to um, basically use a Bayes rule to kind of fill this in. So what we want is the probability that um, given that I've got this particular document, so somebody sent me this particular email or I have this particular IMDB review, um, what's the probability that its class is equal to, I don't know, positive, right? So for this particular movie review, what's the probability that its class is positive? Right, and so we can say, well, that's equal to the probability that we got this particular movie review. Given that its class is positive, multiplied by the probability that any movie review's class is positive, divided by the probability of getting this particular movie review. All right, that's just basis rule. Okay, and so we can calculate. Uh, all of those things, but actually what we really want to know is is it more likely that this is class 0 or class 1, right? So what if we actually took probability that it's class 1 and divided by probability that it's class 0? What if we did that, right? And so then we could say like, okay, if this number is bigger than 1, then it's more likely to be class 1. If it's smaller than 1, it's more likely to be class 0. Right? So in that case, we could just divide um, this whole thing right, by the same version for class 0, right, which is the same as multiplying it by the reciprocal. And so the nice thing is now that's going to put a probability d on top here, which we can get rid of, right, and a probability of getting the data given class 0 down here, and the probability of getting class 0 here, right? And so if we basically what that means is we want to calculate the probability that we would get this particular document given that the class is 1 times the probability that the class is 1 divided by the probability of getting this particular document given the class is two, uh, 0 times the probability that the class is 0. So the probability that the class is 1 is just equal to the average of the labels, right? Probability that the class is zero is just one minus that, right? So, uh, so there are those two numbers, right? I've got an equal amount of both, so it's both 0.5. Um, what is the probability of getting this document given that the class is one? Can anybody tell me how I would calculate that? Uh, can somebody pass that back, please? Thank you, Devish. Uh, look at all the documents which have class equal to one. Uh huh. And one divided by that will give you. So uh, remember, it's though it's going to be for a particular document. So, for example, we'd be saying like, what's the probability that this review is positive, right? So what? So you're on the right track. But what we have to going to have to do is we're going to have to say, let's just look at the words it has, and then multiply the probabilities together for class equals one, right? So the probability that a class one review has this is two thirds, 
the probability it has movie is one, is is one, and good is one. So the probability it has all of them is all of those multiplied together. Kinda. And the kinda, Tyler, why is it not really? Can you pass that to Tyler? I'm so glad you look horrified and skeptical. Uh, word choice is not independent, Thank so you. that right. doesn't hold. So nobody can call Tyler naive, because the reason this is naive Bayes is because this is what happens if you take Bayes' theorems in a naive way, and Tyler is not naive. Anything but, right? So naive Bayes says, let's assume that if you have this movie is bloody stupid, I hate it, but the probability of hate is independent of the probability of bloody, is it independent of the probability of stupid, right? Which is definitely not true, right? And so naive Bayes ain't actually very good, but I'm kind of teaching it to you because it's going to turn out to be a convenient piece for something we're about to learn later. And it often works pretty well. It's okay, right? I mean, it's, 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 I, would never, I would never choose it, like I don't think it's better than any other technique that's equally fast and equally easy, um, but, you know, it's a thing you can do, uh, and it's certainly going to be a useful foundation. So, uh, so here is our calculation, right, of the probability that this document is uh, that we get this particular document, assuming it's a, a positive review. Here's the probability, given it's a negative, and here's the ratio, and this ratio is above one. So we're going to say I think that this is probably a positive review. Okay, so that's the Excel version. Um, and so you can tell that I let your net touch this because it's got LaTeX in it. We've got actual math. So um, so here is the here is the same thing. Um, the log count ratio for each uh, feature f for each word f. Um, and so here it is um, written out as Python. Okay. So our independent variable is our term document matrix. Our dependent variable is just the the labels for the y. So using NumPy, this is going to grab the rows where the dependent variable is one. Okay, and so then we can sum them over the rows to get the total word count for that feature across all the documents, right? Plus one, right? Because that's the email. Terence is totally going to send me something about Viagra today. I can tell. That's that's that. Done. Yeah. Okay. So I'll do the same thing for the negative reviews. Right, and then of course it's nicer to take the log, right? Because if we um, take the log, then we can add things together rather than multiply them together. And once you like multiply enough of these things together, it's going to get kind of so close to zero that you'll probably run out of floating point, right? So we take the log of the ratios, um, and then we can, as I say, we then multiply that, or in log we subtract that uh, from the, sorry, add that to the uh, Ratio of the, the class the whole class um, probabilities all right So uh, in order to say for each document um, Multiply the Bayes probabilities by the the counts we can just use matrix multiply Okay, and then to add on the um, The log of the class ratios we can just use plus B and so we end up with something that looks a lot like our Logistic regression, right? But we're not learning anything, right? I'm not in kind of a SGD point of view. We're just we're calculating it using this theoretical model, okay? And so, as I said, we can then compare that as to whether it's bigger or smaller than zero, not one anymore because we're now in log space, right? And then we can compare that to the mean, and we say, okay, that's 80% accurate, 81% accurate, right? So naive Bayes, you know, is not is not nothing, it, it gave us something, okay? It turns out that um, this version where we're actually looking at how often a word appears, like absurd, appeared twice. It turns out, at least for this problem and quite often, it doesn't matter whether absurd appeared twice or once, all that matters is that it appeared. So what uh, what people tend to try doing is to say, take the, ter uh, the uh, term Document matrix and go dot sign dot sign Replaces anything positive with one and anything negative with negative one. We don't have any negative counts obviously So this binarizes it so it says it's I don't care that you saw absurd 
twice, and it's clear that you, you saw it. Right? So if we do exactly the same thing um, with the binarized version, um, then you get a, a better result. Okay? Um, okay, now this is the difference between theory and practice, right? In theory, um, naive Bayes sounds okay, but it's it's naive, unlike Tyler, it's naive, right? So what Tyler would probably do would instead say, rather than assuming that I should use these coefficients R, why don't we learn them? Does that sound reasonable, Tyler? Yeah, okay, so let's learn them. So we can, you know, we can totally learn them. So let's create a logistic regression, right? And let's fit some coefficients, and that's going to literally give us something with exactly the same functional form that we had before, but now rather than using a theoretical um, R and a theoretical B, we're going to calculate the two things based on logistic regression, and that's better. Okay? So... Um, So it's kind of like, yeah, why why do something based on some theoretical model? Because theoretical models are never going to be as accurate, pretty much, as a data-driven model, right? Because theoretical models, uh, unless you're dealing with some, I don't know, like physics thing or something, where you're like, okay, this is actually how the world works. There really is no, I don't know, we're working in a vacuum, and this is the exact gravity, and blah, 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 right? Um, but most of the real world... This is how things are. Like, it's better to learn your coefficients and calculate them. Yes, you know. Jeremy, what's this dual equal true? Uh, I was hoping you'd ignore and not notice, but <laughs> you saw it. Um, basically, in this case, our um, term document matrix is much wider than it is tall. Um, there is a reformulation, uh, a mathematically, basically, a, almost a mathematically equivalent reformulation of logistic regression that happens to be a lot faster when it's wider than it is tall. So the short answer is, if you don't put that here, anytime it's wider than it is tall, put dual equals true, and it'll run. This runs in like two seconds. If you don't have it here, it'll take a few minutes. Um, uh, so, like in math, there's this kind of concept of dual versions of problems, which are kind of like equivalent versions that sometimes work better for certain situations um, Okay, um, here is so here is the uh, binarized version right um, And it's yeah, it's about the same right so you can see I've fitted it with the the sign of the doc of the doc term doc matrix and t t predicted it with this right um, now the thing is that this is going to be um, a coefficient for every term uh, There was about 75,000 terms in our vocabulary um, And that seems like a lot of coefficients given that we've only got um, 25,000 reviews, so maybe we should try regularizing this So we can use uh, regularization built into SK learns logistic regression class Which is um, C is the parameter that they use um, a smaller this is slightly weird a smaller parameter is more regularization Right, so that's why I used 1.8 to basically turn off regularization here. So if I turn on regularization, set it to 0.1, um, then now it's 88%. Okay, which makes sense. You know, you you wouldn't you would think like 75,000 parameters for 25,000 documents. You know, is likely to overfit. Indeed, it did overfit. Um, so this is adding uh, L2 regularization to avoid overfitting. Um, I mentioned earlier that as well as L2, which is looking at the weight squared, there's also L1, which is looking at just the absolute value of the weights, right? Um, I, I was kind of pretty sloppy in my wording before. I said that L2 tries to make things zero. That's kind of true, but if you've got two things that are highly correlated, Um, then L2 regularization will like move them both down together. It won't make one of them zero and one of them non-zero, right? So L1 regularization actually has the property that it'll try to make as many things zero as possible, whereas L2 regularization has a property that it tends to try to make kind of everything smaller. Um, we actually don't care about that difference in really any modern machine learning because we very rarely try to directly interpret the coefficients. We try to understand our models through interrogation using the kind of techniques that we've learned. 
Um, the reason that we would care about L1 versus L2 is simply like which one ends up with a better error on the validation set. Okay, and you can try both. Um, uh, with SK learns logistic regression, uh, L2 actually turns out to be a lot faster because you can't use dual equals true unless you have L2. So, you know, and L2 is the default. So I didn't really worry too much about that difference here. Um, so you can see here if we use uh, regularization and binarized, we actually do pretty well. Okay. So. Um, Yes, can you pass that back to Davi, please? Uh, before we learned about elastic net, right, like combining L1 and L2, can yeah. you do that? Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Is that. But I mean, it's like, you know, with with deeper models, it, yeah, I've never seen anybody find that useful. Um, okay, so the last thing I'll mention is um, uh, that you can, uh, when you do your count vectorizer, um, wherever that was. When you do your count vectorizer, you can also ask for um, n-grams, right? By default, we get unigrams, that is single words. But if we uh, if we say uh, n-gram range equals one comma three, that's also going to give us uh, bigrams and trigrams. By which I mean, uh, if I now say, okay, let's go ahead and do the the count vectorizer, get feature names. Now my vocabulary includes a bigram. Right by vast by vengeance and a trigram by vengeance full stop by Vera miles right so this is now doing the same thing but after tokenizing it's not just grabbing each word and saying that's part of our vocabulary but each two words next to each other and each three words next to each other and this ten this turns out to be like super helpful in in like taking advantage of bag of word um, approaches because we now can see like the difference between like you know, not good versus not bad versus not terrible, right? Um, or even like double quote, good double quote, which is probably going to be sarcastic, right? So using trigram features um, actually is going to turn out to make both naive Bayes um, and logistic regression uh, quite a lot better. Uh, it really takes us quite a lot further and, and makes them quite useful. Um, I have a question about um, the um, uh, tokenizers. So yeah. you are uh, saying some max features. So yeah. how are these uh, bigrams and trigrams selected? Right. So um, since I'm using a linear model, I didn't want to create too many features. I mean, it actually worked fine even without max features. I think I had something like I can't remember 70 million coefficients. It still worked, right? But just um, th there's no need to have 70 million coefficients. So if you say max features equals 800,000, um, the count vectorizer will sort the vocabulary by how often everything appears, whether it be unigram, bigram, trigram, and it will cut it off um, after the first 800,000 most common n-grams. N-gram is just the generic word for unigram, bigram, and trigram. Um, so that's why the the, the train uh, term doc dot shape is now twenty five thousand by eight hundred thousand. And like, if you're not sure what number this should be, I just picked something that was really big and you know didn't didn't worry about it too much, and it seemed to be fine. Like, it's not terribly sensitive. All right. Okay. Well, that's uh, we're out of time. So what we're going to see um, um, next week. And by the way, you know, we could have. Uh, Replace this logistic regression with our PyTorch version um, and next week we'll actually see something in the fast AI library that does exactly that um, But uh, also what we'll see next week. Uh, sorry next week tomorrow um, is How to combine logistic regression and naive Bayes together to get something that's better than either uh, and then we'll learn how to move from there to create a, um, a deeper neural network to get a pretty much state-of-the-art result uh, for structured learning. All right, so we'll see you then.